Amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good. Okay, good. All right. Are you ready for the word? Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Whoever that was, thank you. Was that you, Chris? Or who was that? The treat. Thank you so much. I appreciate that one clap. That was good. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, do me a favor. Let's get into this. Um, turn with me to Luke chapter 14. I want to get right into the word of God. And um, I do want to welcome everyone that's here this morning. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. Love you guys. And listen, how many of you know, uh, man, that we need this? Amen. We need this. We need, we need this. We need the word. We need God. We need his word to help us, change us, deliver us, redeem us. We need his word to do all kinds of things in our lives, right? Um, how many of you can agree that we need help? We need help. How many of you can agree that we're living in a dark world in some dark times? And I don't know um, if you kind of feel that 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 pull and pinch of fear um, that just kind of creeps over us sometimes because of the world that we live in. But because the world is so dark, the answer is always going to be the light that comes through the word of God. And when I talk to people at times about my faith or, or, or Christianity or following Jesus or the word of God, there are so many questions, but the more and more, and let me just, let me, let me help some of you out this morning. The more you read about Jesus, the more you read about his life, the more you read about what he teaches, what he requires and commands from us, the more you read about how he wants us to live. If you really dig into it, you're at some point, you're Something's going to click and you're going to say, man, this makes sense. This makes sense. Like for me to, to, to love and to forgive, it makes sense rather than to hold on to a grudge and be bitter. For me to serve and, and to love others and to give my life for a cause, that makes sense than to just give my life for myself or my cause or my kingdom. Like that makes sense to me. The way God teaches us how to be patient, that makes sense to me. You're going to start to see these things um, in your own life, and you're going to start to think to yourself, like, man, I've been, I've been doing it all wrong for so long. And if you've been living or endeavoring to live for Christ, I promise you, and this is why we're talking about it, at some point, you will want to quit. Because you're, you're going to face things in your life that you've never faced before. You're going to feel like certain things are unfair. You're going to feel like God didn't come through when he was supposed to come through. You're going to feel like God has been lagging or lacking on his answer to your prayers. You're going to be angry with God or you're going to be angry with me or you're going to be angry with the church in whole. I don't know. You will figure out a way to be offended some way, some shape, some form, somehow. And you're going to want to quit. But don't let. Man, don't let the world, don't let yourself, don't let the enemy, don't let people lie to you. Don't let, li listen, if you're struggling, anybody in here ever struggle at times? If you're struggling, don't allow the devil to lie to you and tell you that you can't do it, that you're not good enough. Don't let the enemy tell you that. Look at you. You see, you can't even figure it out. How long have you been trying to serve God and you guys are still struggling? You're still struggling in your life. Personally, you're still struggling in your marriage. Look at your family. God's never going to save them. But these are all the lies that will keep you away from continuing to walk with God. And it's going to put you into a place to where one day you might tell yourself, man, I want to quit. Don't do it. Don't do it, church. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to go away from God. It's not worth it to go back to your old life. It's not worth it to go back to your old ways, your old habits. It's not worth it. And if there's going to be a few things that we're going to talk about this morning, it's, 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 it's some things that I really, really want us to get a hold of because I think sometimes we miss it and we get it wrong regarding the gospel. And so I want to read out of Luke chapter 14 before we get into the, the very first thing I want to talk about. Luke 14, 25 through 35 out of the ESV says this. It says, now great crowds accompanied him. Talking about Jesus. A lot of people were starting to get familiar with who Jesus was. He was becoming more popular, more well-known because of all that he was doing. And he turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me. Now, now I'll explain this to you. That way you can understand this, the language. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, 
even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. A strong language, but don't worry, I'll break it down for you guys. It's not what you think it is. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, you got to ask yourself this question. Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Now, don't just say yes, because that's the right thing to say. Let's listen to what Jesus has to say about this before you answer that. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower or a house, maybe we would understand better, does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. That's, that's a little bit what I was talking about earlier, right? Some of you, you walk in here and we get excited for Jesus, but then something comes against you and you feel like you can't continue or you want to quit, right? That's, that's it right there. Like, man, I started something, but, but man, it, you know what's crazy too is when you start to live this life, I promise you, your family and your friends that are not serving Jesus, they are waiting for you to give up. They are waiting for you to quit so they can say, ha, ha, see, I told you. I told you you weren't about that life. I told you you weren't going to do it. I told, See, that whole, I knew it was just a phase you were going through, that whole Christianity thing. That's what, that's what the scripture is talking about. That's what Jesus is saying. You got to count the cost. That way, that way you don't end up in that position to where someone is saying, I see, see, I told you, Miguel, I knew you weren't going to make it. He said, you, you said you were all about Jesus, but look at you now. And Jesus is saying, look, this is what you have to do. You have to figure out if you're really about this life. Otherwise, when he laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while there is a, yet another, and, and if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you, that's us, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one is this. If you're going to want help in not quitting, number one is you have to understand the mission. You have to understand the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it means to truly follow him. And what it means to truly follow Jesus. You got to understand in the very beginning of the text, the Bible says that, that massive crowds were following him. So, so here we are, is that everyone was becoming familiar with Jesus because he was becoming so popular. It's like he was trending. It's like the things that we, we know in our lives in this world that take place, right? They become popular. They trend. They get our attention. We want to buy it. It's something, whatever it is. It's the miracle health diet. It's the miracle pill that we can buy. On My, my mom still shops on QVC. I didn't even know that thing still existed. But she still <laughs> buys things off that. She calls on the phone, I think. I didn't know. I just thought everybody still shopped online. But there's all these things that we see that we feel, listen, that we feel is going to make our life better. Right? And so here's Jesus. No, here's Jesus. And here, this is what the scripture says. It says that massive crowds were following him. This is why. is because everyone wanted something that Jesus had. They wanted a benefit. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that because Pastor Cassie, Pastor Kathy, Cassie, Cassie, Kathy, she talked about the woman that pursued him, the woman with the issue of blood, that, that climbed her way through the crowds to just touch the hem of his garment because she knew that her faith would make her whole if she could just touch the clothing of Jesus. Right? And so everyone loved the, the miracles, the healing, the teachings, the free food that Jesus was offering. But, but here's what Jesus knew is that he knew in their hearts he knew that they desired the benefits of what he did rather than having an understanding of who he was. They loved his gifts, but they didn't know or love the life that he was calling them to live. Do you understand? That word hate is not the word that you think. It's an Aramaic word. It's a word that's spelled S-N-A, sna. And what that means is to put aside. To, to, what he's saying is this, he's, he's using strong language because Jesus is saying this, look, if you're going to follow me, 
then you're going to have to give all your life to me. And in, in order for you to give all your life to me, you're going to have to put everyone else and everything second place. So when he says things like hate your mother and your father, hate your wife, what he's saying is this. He's like, you're going to have to put them aside, and I'm going to have to be first place in your life. This is the only way that you're going to understand the mission. Because what, what, truly what we all want is, is we all want something from Jesus. We're just not all willing to give everything to Jesus. We all want the benefits from God, but we're not really willing to give all of our life to God. You ever, you ever, you ever sat down with God and, 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 and pled with him? And made deals with him? I, I should say you try to make deals with him? Like you're, 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 in, you're stuck in a situation and you know you need God's help and you know the only thing that, that can really, really help you is a miracle from God or a change or something like that. And, and the prayer goes something like this. God, if you do this, if you do this, this and that for me, then God, I'll give you all my life. And I promise God, I'll go to church. I'll serve you. Now, now hear me, because sometimes that, that is a wholehearted prayer, but you're not going about it the right way. I understand because I've been there. You need to understand the mission. You need to understand what it truly means to serve Jesus. Jesus makes this statement when it comes to following him again, and he says this. He's going on talking to the, to, to, the, to the people, and he says this statement at the very end. He says, let the dead bury the dead. What does that mean? What does that mean, Pastor Eric? Let the dead bury the dead. It's very similar to what he's saying um, about, about men. Just forget about everything else that's going on in the world. Put that all to the side and put your attention on me first. Now, has God blessed any of you? In ways, yeah, thank you very much. Has God blessed you guys? Has he shown up? Yes, exactly. But see, but what I don't want is I don't want you to try to use Jesus as a functional savior just so you can get something from him that's going to benefit your life without giving your life to him completely. That's not the way it works. That's not the way you treat God. That, 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 this is, now, this is, this is the way our kids treat us at times. I'm going to tell you what, when my kids want something from me, Man, they come to me and they're like, can I go here? Can I do this? Can you buy me this? And man, when you grant that for your children, how exciting is it for them? Man, they're so excited. You're the best parent in the world. They love you so much. Man, they're massaging your back. They're, they're, they're doing all the dishes. They're vacuuming because they want to go to that place. Where they're, but, but listen, but, but you know and I know that once you give that to them, that that, whatever that is, That'll run out, right? And at some point, they'll get over that, and they're going to want something else from you. Do you get what I'm saying? And then, whether you give it to them or not, let's say you don't. Oh, oh, here comes the attitude. Here comes the quiet and silent treatment. Here comes them going into the room, closing their door, not talking to you because you didn't let them go where they wanted to go or you didn't buy them what you wanted to. They wanted you to buy them. You understand? We're all, you guys are all, come on, but you're like that with God. You're like, man, God, you haven't answered my prayer yet. You know what? I'm not going to church, man. God, you haven't done, you haven't done what I asked you. God, I have not seen the change that I wanted to see. So you know what? I'm not going to pray. You know what, God? I'm tired. I'm going to quit. I'm going to give up. You know what? That's the same mentality that we had. Because if you don't understand the mission, you see, Jesus saw everyone. He saw their hearts. People were following him, but they were following him. It wasn't for the wrong reasons, but they didn't really understand why. They didn't really understand exactly what they were supposed to do. And Jesus turned around and he told them, you really want to follow me? It's going to cost you. They were just excited about the miracles, the healings, everything that he could offer to them. But they, 
They didn't understand the mission. And Jesus was saying, like the scripture tells us, when we follow him, we have to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That God wants every single part of us. That God wants to be first place in our lives. And he says, let the dead bury the dead. What does that mean? Well, Ephesians 2, 1 tells us this, that we were once dead in our trespasses. So you know what that means? That means that you were not alive in Christ. That means that you could not see. That means that you didn't know who you were yet. And so God is saying this, those that are apart from Christ, right, that don't know any better, better, that haven't had the veil pulled back, that can't see the light for themselves, those that don't know Jesus, they're dead in their trespasses. So let those people deal with all the things out there in this world. And Jesus is saying, and you that are alive in me, that are not dead, but are alive in me, He's saying, you give me your life, give me your heart, and listen to what I have to say, and follow what I have to say, because I'll tell you what, it's not always easy, church. It's not. I've been there. I felt that way at times. I, man, I felt that like that, you know, over the years, I felt like, like a few things. I felt like I'm missing out on certain things, but, but this is just regarding the world, right? I felt like I didn't have a lot of friends, or I didn't have many friends, Someone, someone that, that, that uh, a, a person that has come to church, um, oh, Wendy, what's your friend name, friend's name? She works on Sundays, but she would love to be here every Sunday. Lindsay. Lindsay. She was talking to me in the back right there, and she just says, man, I, I came here, and I just heard the word of God, and I was just looking around, and I was like, I wanted to jump up and clap because I was so excited about what was being taught. And she said, I am so surprised that, that this church, and she's like, I don't mean anything bad by it. But she goes, I'm so surprised that this church is not bursting out with people that there's no seats available for them. And I said, well, I understand that. I said, because the moment I tell you that you got to give all your life to Jesus is the moment that you begin to struggle. The moment that I tell you that sacrifice and selflessness comes into play, the moment that I tell you that God wants all of your heart, the moment that I tell you that, that this, is, this is not just all about the benefits because there are benefits to serving Jesus. Don't get me wrong, my brother and sister. God is a God that loves you. He loves his children. He loves to bless. He loves to open doors. He loves to change us and do things inside of us. But first, but see, let's not go there first. Let's give our lives to God first. Let's put our heart in Jesus first. Let's say, God, what do you want from me, God? How can I serve you, God? What is it that you need me to do in your kingdom, God? How can I be a part of building your kingdom while I'm here on this earth, God? I just don't want to look at you as a functional savior. I don't want to just cry out to you when I need you, God. I don't want to just pray to you and ask you to do the things that I need you to do for me or to give me the things that I want you to give to me. God, I should be saying, God, you saved me. You forgave me. You delivered me. I have eternity. There's security. I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. So now, God, I want to give you all my life how can I serve you God I understand I've counted the cost I know it's not going to be easy I know it might be difficult I know I might want to give up but I know that it's worth it I know that I need this I know my marriage needs this I know my family needs this I know my children need this I know my extended family need this I know my friends need this I know my co-workers need this God so please build me up God because I want to be used by you you have to understand the mission that's at hand because if you don't you're going to want to Quit. You cannot follow Jesus with all your heart while holding on to the world with half your life. It won't work. So you have to flip it. You, you have to understand, man, God does love you, my brother and sister, so much. You have no idea how much God loves you. And he wants good for your life. He wants change in your life. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be blessed. He wants that for you. But you need to understand, but that's not how you can, that's not the only way to look at God. He's your savior. He's your king. He's your Lord. And he wants all of your life. He doesn't just want a little bit of it. So when you understand the mission that's at hand in building the kingdom while you're here on this earth in serving him and loving, when you understand that, I promise that's going to help you when those feelings of quitting come into play. 
And so here's, here's what we'll do. We'll get to number two. Is after you understand the mission, you have to have a vision. You have to have a vision for your life. Now, I'm going to say some things right here. And I'm, I'm not knocking this in any way. Because when, every time I say have a vision, I know automatically we just start to think of all the things we want God to give us. <laughs> I know that. But I'm going to go in a, in a little bit different direction for you. Because the very first vision that you need to have is for yourself spiritually. It's the change that you need to make internally, right? It's like, it's like, man, when we say vision, and the scripture tells us in Proverbs um, 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he, joyful is he. But I think when we think, like, we always think of, like, the things that are just, they're, and they're dear to us, and they're true. Like, I, I think of, of, you know, maybe you're single and you want to be married, right? And you're just, like, thinking to yourself, like, don't shake your head if you don't want to be married. That's, maybe that's not you. But I know a lot of people that are single and they desire to be married. But the very first thing that they think of is the person that they want God to bring them. Right? It's like, man, God, let him be rich. Shoot. Let him have that good, good job, Lord. Come on now. Let him be handsome. At, man, if not six foot, at least five, ten, eleven. Not short like Pastor Eric. He's too short. <laughs> you know, let him, let him have some, some good looks, Lord. Let him be funny, Jesus, Lord. Man, I'm putting this on my vision board right now. Funny, <laughs> sense of humor. Let him be, he's got to love kids, God. He's got to love those kids, Lord. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that, so like the vision is always about what, but, but like the vision is not ever like, Lord, I, I desire to be married. But what's inside of me that needs to change so I could be a good spouse? Like, Lord, what are the things that need to be addressed in my heart first? Because I get it. Like, we all want to throw up our vision boards and listen to Terry Savelle and look at all the things that, you know, that God. And that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying there's a time and place for that. But your very first vision should be for you personally and spiritually. Like, I'm going to give you some, some, some good ideas here, right? Like, like I, 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 you know, it's, it's funny of what I'm saying, but it's the truth, right? Yes. It's like, man, this is what I want. But God is saying, but wait, hold on. Let's address you first. Because there's some things that we got to dig out of your heart first. And there's some things that we need to change. Like, Lord, prepare me, right? Yes. Man, Lord, I want the job. I want the career. I want the house, Lord. Man, that car, like those are all things, are all, those are all good things, all good things, right? They're fine. And you can have a vision board for those things. But man, you know what? Like, let's keep it simple, right? Like, how about we start with a spiritually vision? This is, this is a vision, right? Lord, help me be loving. Don't be mean. Don't be mean. Don't be rude. Don't get angry quickly, right? Help me be loving, Lord. Develop that love. Lord, help me be forgiving. I need, I need that in my life, God. I grew up holding grudges. I grew up with bitterness in my heart. Man, I have anger towards family members or people that have hurt me. I still got that inside of me, Lord. But I know that you need to change that in me. Help me be forgiving, God. I don't want to hold grudges anymore. Lord, help me be graceful help me be graceful God help me show grace help me not just focus on the negative come on somebody Amen. help me not magnify the negativity that goes on in my life help me not magnify the negativity that goes on in this world I don't want to focus just on the negative you should be pinning this up on your vision board right now be loving be forgiving be graceful don't be mean don't hold grudges don't focus on the negativity Help me be faithful, God. Yes. I don't want to give up. I want to be loyal to you. I want to serve you. I want to understand what this is about. I I'm in this for the long haul, God. Help me be teachable. Uh-oh. Help me be teachable. 
Don't think you know it all. Help, Lord, help me be teachable, God. I, need, I, I want to be a learner. I want to come in and, and I want to absorb all that your word has to teach. And I want to apply that to my life. See, this, these are the types. This is the type of vision that you need to have for your life first and foremost. Help me be obedient, God. I don't want to ignore the truth. I want to embrace it. Help me be watchful, God. I don't want to get lazy. Come on, some of you. What happens when you get lazy? You become vulnerable in the wrong way. When you become vulnerable, you're easily tempted. Be obedient. Be watchful. Help me be patient. Remember what we said about patience? You remember that last two weeks ago? We said patience is not just the act of waiting. It's how you act while you're waiting. So, Lord, help me be patient. Help me not have a bad attitude. Help me be positive. Help me see things from a perspective of positivity. Man, that's so hard to do in this world. Help me be humble, God. Let humility flow through me. You don't want to know one of the best ways to stay humble? Is to not compare yourself to other people. Les, are you okay this morning? Amen. Because you're not saying nothing, and you're my amen corner. I mean, if, I, if I've offended you, I am sorry, Les. All right. Are you all right? Yeah. All right. I love you and your family, too. I just, like, you're just so quiet, and I'm like. <laughs> well, you can fall asleep. <laughs> you better not be, because Josh was earlier, and I was going to get him, Josh. He went on that hike yesterday. They were tired, huh? Listen, be humble. I'm, I'm serious. You, you, you stop comparing yourself to everybody else. You stop comparing yourself to what you see on social media. You stop trying to live up to what everybody else wants you to live up to. You stop trying to keep up with everybody else. You stop, try, you stop trying to do the things that you know that, know that in, in the end of, that, of our life, they don't really matter that much. Right? Be, learn to be content with what you have. Learn to be grateful with what God has brought to you in your life. I promise you, you'll, you'll walk in humility when you, don't, when you learn not to compare yourself to others. Be selfless. Be selfless. This is, this is, this is I mean, the way we are created by default is to be selfish. It's to think about us. But to be selfless is to think about others and to... Build God's kingdom, which requires you to focus and understand what the mission is at hand, and that's to serve Jesus with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Be courageous. Be courageous. Don't run away. Don't run away from your problems. Don't run away from your situations. Know that, like Brother Lewis said the other day, um, or Pastor Kathy or Brother Lewis, I think Pastor Kathy was quoting Brother Lewis, that God will never leave you nor forsake you, that God will be with you. He will fight your battles for you. Don't run away. Be courageous. Be strong. Be uncompromising, Claudia. Be uncompromising. I'm serious, not just for Claudia, I'm saying everybody. Don't give in. Don't give in to this world. Don't give in to your flesh. Don't give in to temptation. Stay focused. Stay focused on your relationship with God. Be loyal and faithful to God. Have a vision for your life. I'm giving you all the things that, that I could think of that you need to uh, um, um, write down and say, God, this is what I need help with, God. How many of you could use some help in being patient? How many of you could use some help in being loving? How many of you could use some help in being more forgiving? So you see, start with you personally first. Be generous. Don't be stingy or cheap. Be generous. And I'm not talking about to your, just here. I'm saying in general, learn to love and help others. If you have the ability to do that, do that. If God has blessed you with resources, be generous and love others and help them. Be a blessing. Why? Because the scripture tells us it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Listen and be bold. Those are just a few things that I can think of. And when I say be bold, this is what I want, what I want to say to you. Because I've been there before. Is don't be ashamed of your faith. 
I've, I've been, I've been in, in situations in crowds where I've, I've, I've felt that, that, that kind of that pinch of embarrassment where like, like everybody else is doing things opposite of what, the, of what I believe. And then I'm kind of like there and I start to like feel embarrassed about my faith. But I don't want to be embarrassed about my faith. My faith is what saved me. I'm not worried about what everybody else is doing. Let them mock the gospel. I'm not going to mock the gospel. God will not be mocked. For whatever a man sows, that's what they will reap. So listen to me. So when you have a vision for your life like this, then Proverbs 16, 3 comes into play where it says, commit your works to the Lord, submit and trust them to him. And listen, and your plans will succeed if you respond to his will and his guidance. So you understand this? So the vision is not like, like have a vision, I get a vision board, and I put everything that I want from God. That's, that's a, for a time and place, right? But your very first vision board should be saying, God, here's all the craziness inside of my life and my heart. Here, let, you, God, I just want you to know, you're dealing with crazy right now. But let me just say something. God is not afraid of crazy. God is not afraid of pain. He's not afraid of hurt. He's not afraid of sin. What he wants to do is he wants to take the crazy and give you a sound mind. What he wants to do is take the sin and forgive give you. What he wants to do is take the pain and heal you. What he wants to do is take everything that has gone wrong in your life and restore you. So you tell God, God, here's all the things that I need help in my life. And then you go to the word of God and you say, how can I be more loving? How can I be more forgiving? You show up on Sunday morning and you say, man, Pastor Eric talked about love and forgiveness. Man, he's been talking about that. And I'm writing these scriptures down and I'm going to apply this to my life because you cannot have a vision without application. It will not work. The reason I'm telling you this is because I don't want you to quit. For, 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 for many years, I think a lot of times people had it backwards. They were more interested in what God can give them. There was like a, this, this old saying that was just really just crazy. You got to fake it till you make it. Sorry, mom and everybody else that was part of that. <laughs> you got to fake it till you, what does that even mean? I don't want to fake it till I make it. I want God to help me. I'm not worried about what everybody else has going on. I want what God has for me. Commit your works to the Lord. Submit and trust them to him. And listen, listen, and now. Man, that vision board pops up on the other side. This is the good stuff, right? Stuff I'm believing for. Man, that, 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 that job, uh, uh, going to college, graduating, uh, that new career opportunity. Man, I'm believing God for a, a, a place to live, a, a buy it. To, man, this is crazy, but man, to try to buy a home now, it just seems so like wild and unattainable. But I promise you, with God, all things are possible. Man, Lord, I want you to help me become the, the spouse that you want me to become for my future spouse. I'm not, I'm not going to think about what I want. I already know what I want in that person. But, man, Lord, how are you going to change me for that? Lord, what is it that you need me to do? Uh, man, I want all, I need to change myself here. Now I'm looking at my vision board here. Lord, how can I get to that career? What are the steps that I need to take? Because I know that I can't just believe for it because faith without works is dead. It doesn't work. So I know, God, that you require from me. So while you're changing me on the inside, how are you going to help me get to this place on the outside? Oh, man, are you guys tracking with me this morning? Because I'm trying to help some of you out this morning. When you learn to think like this, it'll be much harder for you to quit. Because you're building up your spirit man and your spirit woman. Every, let me just say something. Everything that, everything that, I, that, everything that I have in my life, I, I look back, and a lot of the things that, that God has blessed me with inside and out are things that I never even prayed for. You understand? Like I chose to walk in obedience, and because I walked in obedience, God provided. And because I chose to develop my spiritual man, God blessed. You understand? So, so my relationship with God was not one way. It was two way. I decided to give my heart to God. 
Not because, not for what he could do for me, but because I love him so much. And I know that there's people out here, outside this building right now, that are lost, hurting, and broken. And we are the light. So I chose to be the light. And in the process of that, all kinds of things just happened. I'm serious. Things that I, I never believed God for took place in my life, miracle after miracle. And all I could do was thank God for that. And some of you in here, I'm trying to get you to that place to where you see if you just give God your whole heart, if you just tell him, Lord, I want you, nothing but you, everything else is second. I put everything else to the side, and I know when I do this that you will provide, you will bless, the provision will be there, the doors will open. Do you understand? Sorry. I just, I'm just, I just think to myself, and I've told you this before, I don't deserve to be here and I don't deserve what I have, but that's the goodness of God. That is the grace of God. That is how God kept me. And let me say this, and that's how God will keep you, but you got to keep your eyes and focus. If you want to be my disciple, he says. And you have to put everything else to the side. It doesn't mean that you don't care. It doesn't mean that you're not attentive to that. It just means that you're focused on him. And my last point is this. Is when you understand the mission and you understand what your relationship with Jesus is supposed to look like. And you begin to have a proper vision for your life. A proper vision, right? Like, let's just call it vision one and vision two, okay? It's true, right? God, here's the vision for my life. This is what I need. I need change in these areas, right? And Lord, I know that if, if you can build me up and I can be obedient to you, then I know that you will lead me to this side, vision two, right? The things that you're believing for, because God cares about those things deeply as well. When you learn to understand and you learn to have a vision, then number three, you have to learn to move with purpose. You have to learn to move with purpose. Every single day that you wake up, you should be acknowledging your heavenly father with gratitude for his mercy and his grace. You should be thanking him that you have another day. No matter how bad you think your life is, you should be thankful that you have breath in your lungs, that you're able to get up. If you have a job, you should wake up and you should thank him for the job that you have. It might not be the job that you want, but that's okay. You thank him for the job that you have. If, you, if, if, if you're not living in the place that you want to live in, you should thank him that you have a roof over your head. You should thank him for the meal that you ate last night and the meal that you ate this morning. You should thank him for your family. You should thank him for your children even though they might get on your nerves and you want to spank them at times God I'm thankful for my little blessings that are boogers at times I love them so much God I want to pour into their lives I want to be the example to them God help me listen you have to move with purpose I want to be the example for my children to see this is what it looks like to live a godly life this is what it looks like to serve Jesus I understand the mission of Jesus Christ and this is the vision that I have for my life I want my children to see that I'm changing they know who I used to be, but I'm not that person anymore. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. I want them to see that I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I want them to see who mom and dad really are, that they're changing, that they've changed, that they're still running the race that God has called them to live, that they're not giving up and they're not quitting. They're not turning back. That's waking up every day and saying, I am going to move with purpose. I'm not going to let the world bring me down. I'm not going to let my emotions or my thoughts bring me down. They might bring me down, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get back up. I'm not going to let people bring me down. I'm not going to let the circumstances bring me down. I'm not going to let the pain bring me down. I'm going to use that as fuel. Why? Because my God told me. That he's with me, that he's not leaving me, that he's fighting for me. 
He told me to count it all joy when I face trials and various tribulations in my life. He told me that if I go to him and ask him for wisdom, that he will give me wisdom if I do not doubt or, or if I don't doubt, if I'm not like the man that's to and fro going back and forth in his way of thinking, and if I'm not wavering back, God said that he will give me the wisdom to make the, the choices that I need to make. That is moving with purpose. And this is what happened as we close. We're done right now. The children of Israel. I'm just going to read this for you guys and we're going to pray. The children of Israel were stuck in Egypt for 430 years. Listen. This is all us. They were trapped in Egypt under the bondage of Pharaoh. They were slaves. They weren't free. And, and, and then God came in and, and just started wrecking house. And they were eventually set free. And Moses, Aaron, began to take them to what was called the promised land. And as they were exiting Egypt, in Exodus 14, 11, they said to Moses, why did you bring us to the desert to die? Weren't there any graves in Egypt? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? They said, we told you in Egypt. Because listen, listen, you got you to hear me on this. This is all they knew. This is what their whole lives were. This is what they were familiar with. Listen, and even comfortable with. Come on, somebody. You have to get out of this way of thinking. You have to get out of the way of thinking that this is all I've ever known, Pastor Eric. I've never known the love of God. I don't know what it's like to learn how to forgive. I don't know what it's like to be generous. I don't know what it's like to believe God for the miraculous. I don't know what it's like to ask God to help me change. Why? Because I've been stuck in bondage. For so long, I've been a slave to my sin for so long. You don't understand the way I grew up. I grew up. I lived a really rough life. I had a lot of things go wrong in my life, man. I didn't have parents that loved me, man. I was abused. I was neglected. All these things will, will take place in your mind, and the, the enemy will try to tell you that you can never have what God wants you to have, which is freedom. Right. Right. This is what the children of Israel were saying. He was saying, well, well, why did you bring us out of Egypt? We told you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. I would have been better. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. Listen. Moses answered the people. This is what I want you to listen. Because we, we, we quote this a lot, but you got to understand where we're going with this. Moses answered the people and he said, don't be afraid. Stand firm. Those are good words. It says, you will see how the Lord will save you today. Do you see those Egyptians? Come on, church. Do you see your past? Do you see your pain? Do you see what you've gone through? You will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. Just be still. Right? We're, we like, we're all so excited about that. But, but it's so funny that we quote that, but we don't finish reading the rest of it. Because then, then this is Moses. Bo Moses is like, look, the Lord's going to fight for you. Don't just, just be still. You'll never see them again. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, the scripture says, and he said, why are you crying out to me? I love this. I so love this. The Lord's like, why are you crying out to me? Look at what he tells them. He says, tell the people of Israel to move on. Tell them to move on on hold out your walking stick Moses reach out your hand over the Red Sea to divide the water then the people can go through the sea on dry ground you got to understand something Moses had a plan and a set of expectations based on his past history but God told him listen and this is what you got to do but God told him and God will tell you God told him change your mind change your plan because this is how you will become emotionally unstuck the enemy will tell you just stay where you at this is all you've ever known this is what you've done your whole life how you do you're never going to be free from this you're never going to grow out of this you're never going to change but then God's going to come in and say look I, I listen listen hold on listen all you got to do is move on 
done. All you got to do is walk through the Red Sea. All you got to do is leave your past behind. All you got to do is leave your pain behind. All you got to do is walk through the door that I'm going to open for you. Do you understand this? You have to move with purpose. So every day you wake up and you tell yourself, my past, my old habits, my old ways, my old Egypt, I'm not staying there. I'm not staying there. That's, my, that's what I was familiar with, and that's all I've ever known. But here comes God. But here comes God opening your eyes to a brand new life, a life of freedom, of restoration, of deliverance, a life of hope, of faith, of mercy, and of grace. Amen. But listen to me. It's up to you to walk through that. Amen. And it's up to you to move with purpose. Amen. If you do not move with purpose, you will be stagnant. And if you are stagnant and you never make any effort to grow in your life spiritually, you're going to want to Church, God calls us to be the light in this dark world. You have to think like this. There's too many people out there right now that are in darkness. And you're here. And you have the answer. The problem is, is you leave here and you go back to just thinking about yourself. And your week. And your Monday. And your problems. And you lose sight of the mission. My mission is to serve the Lord. It's to, it's to proclaim the gospel. You know, made disciples, make disciples. If you are a disciple of Jesus, then that should be one of your jobs. Man, I, there, there should not be a week that goes by where you're not sharing your faith with someone. Those of you that are coming across people all the time, you understand? But there are, but listen, there shouldn't be a week where, that goes by where you share your, don't share your faith with people, but there's weeks that go by where you don't even read your faith. There's weeks that go by where you're, you're not even crying or praying, crying out to God. We come here on Sunday and we leave this place and we completely forget about all that God has done. And we lose sight of who we're supposed to be in Jesus. And that's unacceptable. God wants so good for your life. I promise you that. He wants good things for you. Come on, stand. He wants really good things for you. But if you don't take this seriously, then you, you, you're going to be challenged tremendously. And, I, and you will. You will want to quit. Come on, all of us. What are we doing here? What, what are we here for? What is this, this, what is this for? At, at what point... At what point are we going to understand that we have responsibilities? That God is asking us to put aside a lot of the things that we just, that our focus is just purely on. And he's saying, focus on me. Love me. Pursue me. Have a vision for your life that's about me. Wake up tomorrow and move with purpose for me. The world is dying. It's not getting any brighter. But if we're, if we're not much different than the world, then we're missing the big picture here. Do you understand? God is calling us to something much Higher and greater than us and ourselves. Amen. 
The, the, the Bible's not about us. We, sh we should figure that out. It's not about us. It's not. The Bible's for us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. And it's about the hope for humanity. And listen, and that hope lies in you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your church. I thank you for every, every man and woman, every young man and woman that has heard your word, Lord. And I, and I pray, Lord, that, that your word has gone on good ground, that we receive your word, Lord, that we understand the mission of this, Lord, what it means to serve you, to give our life for you the way you give your life as a ransom for us. That it's no longer we who live, but you who live inside of us. And that it's our job to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross. That means to put in the work, pick up our cross, and to follow you. And I pray that when we go to you and we have visions or a vision for our life, that we start with us. Change us, God. Help us. And help us, Lord, as we walk out of this place. Let us not lose our purpose. That we move with purpose to serve you. I thank you, Lord, if there's anyone in this place that needs to make you their Lord and Savior, God. They, they want to ask you to come into their heart. They want forgiveness of their sins. If you're in this place this morning as we close, and you need God to just love you and forgive you, you're hearing the message and you're saying, Pastor Eric, I need Jesus to come into my heart. My life has been going in the wrong direction, and I need it to go in the right direction. And I want God to just save me. If that's you, would you just pray this with me? Just say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Lord, I desire to give my life to you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And thank you for raising on the third day the resurrection power that makes you the Son of God the Savior of the world. And thank you, Lord, that I have a new life in you. That my old life, my past, is behind me, God. That I'm a new creation in you. You are my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen church. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. What a great day. Amen. Hallelujah. A great day. I'm just so grateful. You like the weather? Of course. Of course. It's been a lot better than those triple, triple digits, right? But praise the Lord. I always say hell is a lot hotter. Amen. So we don't want to go there, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm excited about things that are going to be coming up this um, next month. Amen. October, we got some good things planned. So pay attention, listen, and it's all going to be good. Amen. Amen. And just a few months away is Christmas. Can you believe that? Wow. Days go by so quickly. I told my grandkids yesterday, let's put up the tree. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't matter, right? It's whenever you want, right? So praise the Lord. Amen. But uh, praise God. God is so good. Amen. Always, always so good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to give? Yes. Amen. I know you are. I know you are. So Genesis 22. Praise the Lord. Verse number one. Of course, I love the story of Abraham because it's mentioned so much about the faith of Abraham, the father of faith. Amen. And so it says in uh, Genesis 22, verse 1, after all this, God, I'm reading out of the message, God tested Abraham, and he said, Abraham. And the Lord answered, I mean, Abraham answered, said, I'm listening. And he said, take your dear son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll appoint out to you. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled the donkey, took the two uh, young servants and his son Isaac, 
split the wood for the burnt offering set out for the place God had directed him. On the third day, he looked up and saw the place in a distance. And Abraham told his two young servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there to worship and then we'll come back to you. I love this story because, first of all, um, Abraham waited so long to have his only son. Amen. And um, years, it took years, 25, some, somewhere around in there, years for the miracle of his son to come forth. And then God asks him this difficult question, this situation that God brought about. Uh, to Abraham. And you know, too many times I think we think that God um, is just ready to do something, and He is. But how many of you know that we as Christians and we as uh, believers and we as sons and daughters of God, we have a responsibility? Did you know that you're responsible to hear God? You're responsible to listen and to hear God and not just hear God, but you are responsible to obey. Amen. God's just not going to force you to do anything because he never will uh, impose on your will. You have a will and you have, you're in charge of that will. So whatever you do is, is, is your choice. And whatever choices we make, we can't just blame God. Amen. If you're in a situation, you can't always just blame God because God is not the one that makes the choices for you. So Abraham really did have a choice, right? He did. He waited forever for his son, and then he finally got his son. He loved his son because uh, that's what it says, whom you love. God knew that he loved him. Just like you love your children, God knew that he loved Isaac and that he waited all these years for Isaac. God knew that. Amen. And Abraham right then and there had a choice. And don't you think that he might have just for a moment stopped and said, Man, this is the hardest thing God is asking, and I just, I don't know. Have you ever done that? I just don't know, God, if I could do that. I don't know, God, if I could really be a tither and a giver. So you have a choice. It's your decision if you're going to be that person that God has instructed and called us to be. We have that choice. It's our responsibility. It, this was Abraham's responsibility to act on what God just spoke. Amen. Abraham, first of all, heard, he listened, and then he did it. Take your son whom you love, go to the land of Moriah. I'm going to show you where to go, Abraham. So what did he do? He did exactly what God said. He saddled the donkey. He cut the wood. He packed everything up. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. We all have, to, we know we have things to do to follow the instructions of the word of God. When God says to live right, when he tells us what to do, when he says love, when he says forgive, when he says walk in my obedience, those are our instructions. If you read Proverbs, the very the third chapter, the very first verse, it says, uh, follow my instructions. If you want to live long, follow my instructions. Live the way that I'm telling you to live. And then it's up to us. Amen. It was up to Abraham. And Abraham did. He took his young servants. He took his son. He took the wood. He took the donkeys. He did everything, and he went out. He set out. He put his foot in front of him. He stepped out, and he went to do exactly what God instructed him to do. Was it difficult? You think how difficult that would be. And, and, and Abraham either just had enough faith to say, all right, I'm going to do this, God, but one way or another, I'm coming back with my son. If I sacrifice him, you're going to raise him from the dead. Amen. I just believe he had that much faith. Do, don't you want that much faith? To say no matter what, God, I just know. Either way, man, I, I'm going to win. Amen. 
You guys aren't saying amen like you believe it. I believe that. <laughs> amen. Amen. We just sang a, a, the giant. We, we, we have overcome. Amen. We, we can win. Amen. The battle's really not ours, but God. God's. Amen. And we can win through him. Amen. And so Abraham did everything. He, he, he carried it. And then he told those two, um, my son and I will be back. Amen. And so the two of them went off, and Isaac said to his father, um, yes, my son, we have everything. He said, we have the flint, we have the wood, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? I wonder what was going through the mind of Isaac. <laughs> I don't see anything that we're going to tie up here. I'm not sure what's going on, but I guess I just have to trust my father. Amen. And so they kept on walking, and they arrived at the place Abraham built the altar. He laid the wood. He tied up Isaac. Oh, my God. I just can't imagine what went through the, the mind of Abraham and his son. I just, man. And Abraham reached out, took the knife to kill his son. Come on, church. I know it's hard to think in your mind, did this really happen? But I believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. I believe it. And just as he was about to do it. Aren't you so glad that God intervenes on our behalf every time when we obey? Amen. Hallelujah. Just then the angel of God called, called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, I'm listening. He said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't touch him. For now I know how fearlessly you fear God. You didn't hesitate. And I just think that's a good word right there because too many a time, too many times we hesitate. Amen. We question, we stop, we reason, we say, I don't know, God, if, you know, I don't know if this is you. I say, someone, preacher used to always say, if it's the tithes and offering, if it's the big figure, it's God. If it's the little one, it's the devil. I don't, I'm just saying what they said, all right? <laughs> but they did, he didn't hesitate. He did not hesitate, the Bible says, that you placed your son, your dear son, on the altar. And Abraham looked up. He saw a ram caught in the thicket. And, of course, we know the end of the story. Amen? Amen. But it was the faith that Abraham had to do what God called him to do. Amen? To do exactly. So when God speaks to you, I pray that you have that attentive ear to hear. And not only hear, but that you obey. Amen. Amen. You obey a God in every area as far as our tithes and offerings. Listen to the voice that's on the inside of you. Amen. And let him speak to you. Amen. Father, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time, this moment that we have, Father, to listen to you, to obey you, God, because we know that obedience, obedience is what draws your attention. Faith is what gets your attention, God. And when we do both of those combined, Father, we know, we know that we have your attention and we know that you listen and you hear our hearts cries and our prayers, God. So as we obey you in our tithe and as we obey you in our offering we thank you that your word says that you give back to us good measure pressed down shaken together and running over God so we put our faith on the line as we sow our seed father in this time right now in this day we sow into the kingdom of God onto good ground knowing that our our seed will produce good things in our lives and in HD Church, God. We just praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ushers, if you would, minister to the people.